I'm Caroline Hyde, in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, full steam ahead for the US labor market with 209,000 jobs added in July. Has tech helped or hindered with the ongoing jobs bonanza? We talk coding and the future of automation. Plus, a Bloomberg scoop. The Apple Watch is breaking up with the iPhone. We'll break down the plan to introduce a cellular option and the players potentially involved. And after Snap fell victim to Facebook's imitation game, could Google now be looking to copy the company's tech? We'll explain. But first to our lead. The US labor market hit its stride in July, with the jobless rate hitting a 16-year low and monthly wage growth picking up. Employers added 209,000 jobs, while the jobless rate fell another tick to 4.3%. Now, the National Economic Council director, Gary Cohn, spoke with Bloomberg earlier and weighed in on those numbers. The president's completely right. These are good numbers. 209,000 non-farm payroll jobs, unemployment rate down to 4.3 percent, down to a 16-year low. We're bringing Americans back into the workforce, and that's what the president set out to do, and that's what the president is doing. Joining us now from New York to discuss is my guest co-host for the Hour Techonomy CEO, David Kirkpatrick. You know him well. And the Flatiron School co-founder and CEO, Adam Enbar. The Flatiron School is an accelerated program school aiming to train the next batch of software engineers. Adam, I'm going to start with you because, yes, we're seeing full steam ahead. Yes, they're hiring Americans, but they're hiring the lower wage end of the equation in these particular job numbers, it would seem. How many of those, of those in the lower wage, perhaps those that are serving in restaurants and the like, coming to you for retraining? Uh, we have a pretty diverse population, you'd be surprised. So at the Flatiron School, we train software engineers in these really intensive three to five month programs. Uh, we take students without any background in coding and with in that very short period of time, prepare them for a job as a software engineer. We have extraordinarily high place, job placement rates. You can see all of the reporting on our website at flatironschool.com. Um, but the backgrounds range pretty dramatically from investment bankers and lawyers who uh, want, have discovered a new passion for technology to artists, musicians, or people who used to work in minimum wage jobs that are looking to upskill their careers. Um, anybody can learn this stuff, and the job market is exploding in this area. Job market exploding. It's interesting where it's exploding, David. The fact that we're seeing the lower wage group actually starting to pick up in terms of the numbers. This is the area where, you know, we're starting to see iPads as the new way to order your food, for example. Oh, phone call, saved by the bell. But, uh, David, therefore, I thought automation was meant to be eating into the lower wages. Is it not? Well, it doesn't seem to be so far. I mean, certainly there are jobs that are being replaced by automation, but there are tremendous ironies that just as the tech on technology industry gets more and more sort of almost shrill in their assurance that jobs are going to be destroyed by tech and automation and artificial intelligence, we are having harder and harder time finding people to do the jobs that exist now. Uh, and that's happening all across the developed world. So uh, it causes me not to be so worried when you hear there's like 60,000 truck driver jobs going unfilled in the United States today when people start saying, oh, AI is going to drive trucks in the future, which might be the case. But frankly, we are in a very good position and we have time and, and good reason to develop automation now because we actually need to substitute for people because there simply aren't enough people in many spheres, as Adam was just saying, in coding. And obviously coding is actually one area that can be partially automated. And meanwhile, we're seeing other big tech giants doing a lot of the hiring. 50,000 jobs, I think, being advertised by Amazon at the moment. Adam, drill into the companies that you fill places at at the moment. Are they the big tech giants or who's hungry for the talent that you're producing? Is it the startups? Yeah, so, th you know, that's the first place people jump to. And I think that's a big misconception, right? People hear coding and they think Google and Amazon or small startups working on interesting things. And that's all true. But that represents maybe 20% of the people hiring from us. Uh, the reality is that 
today there's not a single industry you can think of, there's not a single product or service that you can imagine that isn't in some way controlled by code. Whether it's in airplanes, cars, uh, media, fashion, every single one of these companies has a website, they have to deliver um, services through technology to their customers, and that's where the big opportunities lie. Right? So when you see um, organizations like Facebook wanting to lobby for more H-1B workers for specialty, uh, with specialty skills, you know, maybe that's good and maybe that's bad, but the reality is that's not going to impact the broad population. The vast majority of the jobs are companies where uh, outdated technology is being used and that's where the opportunity is. And it's not that hard to train people for these jobs, right? When you, when you talk about um, automation, like trucks, uh, truck drivers going away. Um, you know, I think that's actually a really big fundamental shift that we need to be paying attention to because yes, those jobs exist now. And yes, we know for a fact that those jobs will go away soon. But whatever jobs we will create to replace them will also go away. And the reality is that today we just live in a world in which things are changing fast and we have to get used to incorporating learning new skills into our economy and making that part of how people work. Nobody's gonna be able to go to college for four years and then work for the rest of their lives. And so there is a shift going on into how we have to think about education broadly and how that plays into people's careers throughout the course of their entire lives. David, perpetual training, that's the way it's going to be? Yeah, well, I think he's absolutely right. Nothing I said would, should be taken to mean that I think people should be complacent. This is an unbelievable moving target. It, what Adam and, and the Flatiron School are doing is fantastic. People, should, every, all, ideally, everyone should know how to code because we are moving into a world where, you know, we're sort of increasingly coexisting with machines. I mean, as Adam says, every company is automated in one way or another. Every company has some degree of coding going on. And, and we're all sort of moving into this hybrid landscape where we're working alongside computers. Computers are sort of helping us do what we do. And in some ways, we're helping them do what they do. So that is the world we're going into. Nobody should think they can just keep doing things the way they were done before, because that is not going to be the case. Of course. Debate rages on the Flatiron School. Co-founder and CEO Adam Enbar, great to have you with us today. Thank you for talking us through the numbers. Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick, sticking with us, because I want your take on the next story. Now, it's a Bloomberg scoop for you. Apple is planning to release a version of its smartwatch that can connect directly to cellular networks. Now, the move aims to reduce reliance on the all-important iPhone. That's according to people familiar with the matter. While the Apple Watch remains a small part of Apple's overall revenue, CEO Tim Cook said earlier this week it's the best-selling smartwatch by a very wide margin. Joining us now from San Francisco is Bloomberg Technology reporter Mark Gurman, who broke the story. Still with us, of course, to Economy CEO David Kirkpatrick in New York. Mark, break it down for us. Why are they actually trying to sort of distance themselves from the need for the iPhone in your pocket? Right, so right now the Apple Watch requires an iPhone in your pocket or in your bag if you want to download music, look up maps directions, download new apps, and make phone calls on the go. But now they want to sort of turn it into its own device. This is a goal they've had since the very beginning, but now it's starting to become technologically feasible with the help of Intel. It'll have a cellular chip so it can control all sorts of internet connected tasks on its own, and you can leave the phone at home. You mentioned Intel, chip provider. They're going to be a big winner here. What about other companies that are involved in this? Because they've got to be talking to carriers already. Yeah, that's right. Uh, according to the people we've spoke to, Apple is already in talks with the four major United States carriers, Sprint, T-Mobile, AT&T, and Verizon Wireless, to carry this LTE watch by the end of the year. They're also talking to carriers internationally, but the international coverage is going to be a small subset of the carriers that already carry the iPhone outside of the U.S. So this is going to be a long-term rollout type of thing. Okay, Europe comes last as, a, as ever. You guys get to play with these things before us. And David, what therefore do you think of this move? Do you think it's important that we start to separate the phone from the watch and it can be a standalone used feature and product? I think it's kind of a logical idea, but, you know, it is true that when Steve Jobs returned to Apple, he reduced the number of products. And what we see at Apple, and it's and simplified it, we see increasingly at Apple a really, really wide range of things they're doing that grows by the day. And I, I think this is a little bit confusing. Uh, I also highly doubt that they can really keep the battery life good enough 
that the watch can connect to the wireless networks. You can talk through the watch. I mean, I have an Apple Watch just for some fairly elementary functions. It's hard to keep a charge for a whole day in many instances. So I do think it's a very appealing idea. I'm somewhat skeptical that it's something that there's going to be a huge market for. Mark, respond to that because we heard in your piece, in fact, Gene Munster talking about the battery life concerns as well. Right. And let, me, let, me, let me take us back to around this time last year. Uh, we were looking into the feasibility and the possibility of the Apple Watch Series 2 alongside the iPhone 7, including an LTE radio. As we knew, this is something they've been working on for a while. And what we were told a year ago was that, yes, that was the plan for the Series 2 last year, but they weren't able to pull it off because of the performance issues and the battery life snags. Fast forward to today, a year later, they're able to likely push forward with it because of these new, more efficient modems from Intel and the work they've been doing on the Apple Watch's battery life. Don't forget what Apple's been doing with the iPhone for several years is they've been adding new features, but they've been improving the battery life, not to make the battery last longer, but for it to work about at the same performance level as the prior year's model while adding a lot of new functionality. And I think that's what we're gonna see this year. An Apple Watch that gets about the same battery life as the previous few models, but adds that extra functionality. It's a typical Apple move. And it's certainly going to make going out for a jog or going down the shops that much easier, it would seem. Bloomberg Technology reporter Mark Gurman, brilliant scoop for us. Thank you very much for giving us your time. Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick, you're sticking with us. Now, sticking with the jobs numbers that we reported on earlier, Blue Apron is closing a New Jersey facility and moving more than 1,200 jobs to a bigger site opening in the state later this year. Now, more than half of the employees at the Jersey City facility have decided to move to a new warehouse in Linden, New Jersey. Workers notified today of the changes will still have the opportunity to relocate to Linden, we're told. Today, Blue Apron stock hit its lowest level since going public back in June. Now, coming up, we speak with the CEO of the booking site, Trivago. That's Rolf Schrumgens. And dig into the company's latest earnings report. That's next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out. It's at Bloomberg Tech TV. Weekdays, 5 p.m. New York, 2 p.m. San Francisco, 10 p.m. Right here in London. This is Bloomberg. Now, Trivago reported financial results for its fiscal second quarter. The global hotel search platform reported earnings of over $350 million, beating analyst estimates. Though it saw shares drop over 20% in earlier trading. Now, that's due to a surprise second quarter loss amid increased marketing spending. That drop represents its biggest move since the company's IPO back in December. Joining us now on the phone is Trivago CEO Rolf Schrongens. He's from Dusseldorf in Germany. Rolf, thank you for staying up late for us and talking with us. And talk to us first first about the ramp up in spending in terms of advertising this seems to have been what's eaten into the bottom line you know i mean we're doing that consequently yeah? so we're always looking at opportunities and in the moment where we see a positive uh, our eye on our investment so we, we we keep on spending our our share currently of the market is still quite small so we still see a great opportunity to grow the company so we think it's not wise to now like, totally go for profitability. So we will always do what we promised our shareholders in the beginning. Um, we will you know, slightly increase our margin over time, but reinvest into growth. And I think the, the current quarter with 67% growth is also a sign of that. Yeah, certainly revenue up 67%. Why then, when I'm looking at my Bloomberg terminal, I'm typing in G hashtag BTV 7472, I can see the market capitalization dropping by a billion dollars. If your investors knew this was going to be your strategy, why do you think the sell-off? Does it worry you? No, I mean, I mean, we don't manage the markets. You know, we don't manage the stock price. We manage a company. And then we can be as transparent as possible about what we're doing. And we, we have very consistently uh, told the markets, you know, what we're, what we're up for, what we're doing. And uh, we're always telling them the same story over the, over the last year. And, um, and I think in general, I think that is, that is um, the, the, you know, the, what you can see right now in the stock price, you know, trading up from our initial um, IPO price of 11, 11 euro, you can see you can see the growth over time. And uh, you know, I think I think our still our um, our free flow is quite small. There's also lots of volatility in, in, in the stock, and um, and so it's I, I think you shouldn't overinterpret like um, you know the, even if it's going up or down. 
So I think I always said, like, when we went to IPO, I always said, like, let's look after a year and let's see where we are and be continuously managing the business for long-term profitability, and then we'll see where we are. And where are you seeing most growth globally in terms of the rest of the world is doing in particularly well? We've seen Japan, India. Where are you really starting to see yourself gaining market share, and where do you want that market share to be? So, so um, you know, as far as I know, we're gaining market share in all our markets. Um, so we still have a very healthy growth in Europe, over 40%, which were our very established markets, and we're still growing over 40%. Um, but of course, like we see the growth, most growth coming from our rest of the world markets, which are dominant, dominated by the Asian markets. Um, and there we have even growth ratios of above 100%. Um, so we more than doubled our revenue uh, on a year on year comparison. And Rolf, I've got to ask you, last time we sat down, it was in Berlin at the NOAA conference, and you told me, look, Google is a number one competitor. When you see the EU fine coming for Google with respect to its shopping elements, do you think travel is what regulators could look at next? And do you think Google should be investigated for the way in which it treats rival hotel providers such as yourselves, other platforms? Yeah, I think I think it looks like. Yeah? So I think I think they took their decision for that one vertical, but uh, it looks like they would would um, also go for other verticals. Um, still, I think you know I think we shouldn't make yourself dependent on that. So I think we have a very healthy business. We've shown that we can grow. You know, whatever Google is doing in the last six seven years, we have shown that we can grow massively against that. So uh, so we don't want to rely on 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 the EU, you know, to 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 uh, to find them for what they do. Um, so, so we, we keep on growing, and you know, if the EU um, decides decides also to to um, inter, intervene in the travel sector, you know, I think I think that's the right thing to do. But we do not rely on it. Rolf, it's always great to get your take. Travago CEO Rolf from Denzel. It's been wonderful speaking to you live from Dusseldorf in Germany. Now, Bill Ackman is taking aim at Paycheck Processor Automatic Data Processing. Now, Pershing Square confirmed today it owns an 8% stake in that company, but said it would only seek a minority slate on ADP's board after ADP refused to extend the deadline for nominations. Ackman's Pershing also was pushing for the CEO, Carlos Rodriguez, to be replaced. The board rejected that request. Now, ADP said in a statement that, quote, we believe our current board has an effective balance of leadership continuity and fresh perspectives that will help us to continue this strong track record of delivering value to shareholders. Coming up, it's the hype of the Hyperloop, and Elon Musk wants back in. We'll break it all down next. This is Bloomberg. Now, Elon Musk introduced his vision for a futuristic mode of tube-based transportation called the Hyperloop all the way back in 2013. At the time, Musk made it clear that he didn't have any plan to execute the project because, well, he had to remain focused on SpaceX and Tesla. That plan has clearly changed. Last month, Musk revealed on Twitter that he'd received quote, verbal government approval to build a Hyperloop between New York and Washington, D.C. Here to give us his thoughts, guest host for the Hour Economy CEO, David Kirkpatrick. This is quite a turnabout in events. Do you think, therefore, it adds perhaps value to the Hyperloop focus and that some of the startups that are already ploughing the furrows there are going to get a boost or, or a hindrance from this? Well, Obviously, anybody who's involved with Hyperloop has already gotten a huge boost out of Elon Musk's initial idea and promotion of the idea and his, you know, reflective glow. He is an astonishing person to have in your community. Now, if, if he do go, goes directly uh, competitive with your company, that's another matter. It's very hard to know exactly what's happening because the, you know, the, the article and the speculation is somewhat based on um, indirect evidence, statements coming off of, uh, of SpaceX's website that used to say they wouldn't go into this business, for example. Uh, then you have also the fact that Elon Musk has got the Boring Company, which, funny name, but is intended to, it was said to be a, to build roads underneath LA or underneath cities to aid in traffic management, but in fact, maybe building systems to build Hyperloop tubes underground. So 
he is one of the great thinkers of all history. I, I think you could think of him as almost the Thomas Edison for our day. So you wouldn't want to be competing with him. But on the other hand, you would want him talking about what you do. So if you're a company already in the Hyperloop business, it's sort of a yin and a yang situation. Interestingly, we spoke with Shervin Pishava, the chairman of one of those startups, Hyperloop One, it's called. And here's what he said to us just the other day about the so-called competition potential driving this uh, forward. This is a multi-decade effort. It's going to take uh, many, many brilliant minds and, and, uh, and commitment for many people to push it forward. Many, many brilliant minds, maybe Elon Musk's being one of them. Do you think we're going to see in the next, what, five, ten years, this actually become a reality, David? Well, I think one of the reasons that this new report of Musk's revived interest makes sense is that the companies that have done work have made, I think, more rapid progress than somebody would have, many of us would have expected. I think, you know, these companies were formed partly based on the enthusiasm that Musk himself generated, which sounded extremely pie in the sky several years ago when it first emerged. But I do think, like so many things in our era, the, most, the amazing opportunities are arising more rapidly than were anticipated. So. I think it could come quite soon in small places. It's not going to be New York to L.A. in two hours anytime soon. But I do think we might have, you know, Boston to Washington within 10 years or Sydney to Melbourne, which is one that uh, one of the Hyperloop companies doing. Yeah. So, you know, I think it, it's possible something soon. Yeah. David Kirkpatrick, Techonomy CEO, you're sticking with me. Much more. We're discussing Google and fintech next. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of your first word news. The United States has formally notified the United Nations that it intends to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. The State Department says President Trump is, quote, open to re-engaging the deal. Attorney General Jeff Sessions unveiled the government's crackdown on intelligence leaks Friday. To prevent these leaks, every agency and Congress has to do better. We are taking a stand. This culture of leaking must stop. There will be a new counterintelligence unit at the FBI that targets leaks. Venezuela's new 545-member Constituent Assembly today unanimously selected a former foreign minister to lead the new body. He's part of a group of close Maduro allies who resigned top posts to run for the new body, which will have powers to rewrite the Constitution. Irish Prime Minister Leo Varadkar said he hopes European Union leaders will see enough progress on some of the challenges facing Northern Ireland as Britain exits the bloc before he attends a summit scheduled in October. And today we need an answer to a very simple question. Who do I, who do we in Europe speak to when we want to speak to Belfast? Who will speak for Northern Ireland and her 1.8 million people? The time is running out and I fear no extra time will be allowed. Britain is scheduled to leave the EU in March of 2019. In Afghanistan, the Taliban stormed a market Friday in southern Helmand province. The attack was met by a fierce response from Afghan army forces backed by U.S. air support. The market was closed because of the Muslim weekend. The Taliban now control roughly 80 percent of Helmand province. South Korea's spy agency has admitted it tried to manipulate the result of the country's 2012 presidential election. An internal probe found 30 teams worked for at least two years to make sure a conservative candidate won. Conservative former President Park geun hye won over liberal Moon Jae-in, but is now facing trial for unrelated charges of corruption. Moon is now president. Vote counting is underway in Rwanda's presidential election. The incumbent Paul Kagame calls the vote just a formality. He's running against the only opposition candidate allowed and an independent. Soccer star Neymar made his first appearance on the pitch at Paris Saint-Germain Stadium Friday. His $262 million buyout clause from Barcelona was activated on Thursday. At a packed press conference, Neymar called the decision one of the most difficult of his life and that the move was wasn't cash-driven. Global News 24 hours a day. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York.
This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde, in for Emily Chang. Now, London-based Revolut is trying to make managing your money easier no matter where you are in the world. Revolut has developed a platform allowing users to transfer, to exchange, to spend money with a multi-currency card that is accepted everywhere at the best exchange rates possible. Now, the fintech startup recently raised a ton of cash, $66 million to be exact, but earning that cash from multiple VC firms didn't seem to be enough. Revolut also wanted its user base to get involved, crowdfunding almost, well, about £4 million, pounds, that's five point. $2 million using Cedars. That's an online platform for investing in equity of startups in Europe. Joining me now is Revolut CEO Nikolai Storonsky and Tom Davies, CIO of Cedars Platform. Great to have you both with me this Thanks. evening in London. And Nikolai, remind us, I mean, talk to us about, about why you're offering it up to the crowd. You had the VCs backing you. Why save four million for your user base? We just need to allow our user base to make money as well, right? Not only for prof professional VCs, but for, for our customers. Okay, so let them in. Tom, it's interesting that actually Nikolai and Revolut decided to stick to the same terms as Index Ventures, as Balderton Capital had got. In my mind's eye, I remember, you know, retail investors are usually where you get a slightly better deal. They're not quite as investor savvy. Why the transparency? Why the need to give up the same terms? Well, it's, it's actually a, a really good question because Cedars has always uh, long thought that the retail investors should get the same deal. Um, and any uh, company that we work with who's uh, co-investing alongside the crowd, we always make sure the crowd get the same terms. Um, the crowd in this case happens to be uh, Revolut's customers um, and Nikolai recognized early on that the last thing you want to do is give the customers uh, that are using your product worse terms than the people who are investing in from an institutional level uh, and we help facilitate that uh, as, uh, as, as the platform of his choice. So Nikolai, the idea is you splash this cash, you're moving out of just Europe and going to US, to Asia and into cryptocurrencies. Talk to us about the grand plan. Yeah, so the, the main use of cash will be obviously setting up US, uh, launching the product in US. Uh, next one will be Asia, uh, Australia, China, etc. How soon in the US? Uh, it's very soon in the section next three months, and we are launching pre-registration list uh, next week for US. So you can start registrations. And the cryptocurrency element of things, yeah. is that just because it's on trend, people have a bit of Bitcoin, they want to be able to use it through your app as well? Uh, we've got amazing number of requests you know, from our customers to add uh, cryptocurrency. So that's why we, we decided to add it. We always wanted to do it. I mean, I remember two years ago we wanted to add Bitcoin and then uh, no one actually allowed us to do it. And now finally we're at the stage when we can do it and we're very excited. And Tom, as, as Cedars continues to expand, UK, Pan Europe, how many companies are looking to raise cash in this way, wanting not only to go into a mm, the hungry VC community, but also to raise money from a crowd to help market to a certain extent? Well, there are two main reasons why, why companies use uh, Cedars to raise money. The, the first is to access our 250,000 members who are looking to invest in startup and growth companies. Um, and the other reason is um, to use Cedars as a tool um, to help raise money from people they know. Um, in Nikolai's case, it just happened that he knew nearly a million people, <laughs> which happened to be uh, his customer base. Yeah, remind us of the numbers of this crowdfund, because yeah, it's, it's pretty it was, phenomenal, It right? was phenomenal. It's, it's sort of smashed all our records, and, and I, I think it smashed most crowdfunding records, actually. Um, but I, it, it was approximately 40,000 uh, of Revolut's customers pre-registered and expressed an interest to invest nearly 42 million pounds. Um, uh, but there was only uh, 3.8 million that was available, um, so uh, we ran a, uh, a priority access for the for the Revolut premium customers, uh, and then randomised uh, from the remaining, uh, and they ended up with 4,500 people investing in the 3.8 million. Uh, so a huge success, um, and we're seeing the same appetite from from Europe, um, and we actually have four four European deals live on the platform right now. Nikolai, why not an initial coin offering? Uh, I think it's uh, too cool for us. <laughs> <laughs> too cool, too complex, yeah. not, not clear, clear enough? I mean, regulatory question mark still. Yeah, we are, we are kind of at the stage when we become, you know, regulated, a bit mature. Uh, so ICA is still, you know, a bit too, too young instrument for us. And also majority of our users, they, they don't get it yet. Mm. So maybe, you know, next <laughs> funding will be through ICA. Maybe an extra nice year. And Tom, what's interesting about Cedars is that once you've perhaps cashed in on a startup, unlike VCs where you have to sit 
on that holding and wait for them to exit. You can actually trade on a secondary market with you. I mean, is this a way that perhaps if I was an employee at Revolut and I wanted to fund it as well, I could then start to access some of the money and, and, and the spoils of the companies for which I work? Um, I'll let Nikolai respond whether he wants his employees to be selling their options and stock. Um, but yeah, we, we launched a, a secondary market uh, approximately three months ago, uh, which we've used the term Trading Tuesday. So the first Tuesday of every month, uh, the, the, the secondary market platform on Cedars is open for one week. Uh, and that is where investors who have invested in companies like Revolut can sell their stock to other investors who may be interested. Uh, and it is a way of try us trying to help um, provide liquidity to what is traditionally a pretty illiquid asset class. Um, and people are making some pretty hefty returns. I mean, we've been going five years, and the, some of those early investors are making returns of nearly 18x uh, when you factor in the SEIS and the EIS tax relief. So there's money to be made. Uh, still a long way to go, but we see that as a very important step and a very important future of this asset class. And lastly, Nikolai, do, do you want to see your employee base being able to cash in to a certain extent? before you would choose to exit? Uh, yes, actually, our policy, so we allow employees to cash out some of their holdings on investment rounds. Uh, actually, this round will also allow them to do it, but uh, as usual, almost no one sold, so, yeah, but we do allow. They think it's gonna yeah. go higher. Wonderful to have you both here. Late in the Friday evening, go off, enjoy your weekend. Thank you very much, Revolut CEO, Nikolai Storonsky, and Tom Davies, CIO of Cedars. Now, you can read more about fintech in this week's edition of Bloomberg Business Week. Now, the cover story features two brothers who turned seven lines of code into Stripe. It's a $9.2 billion startup, Patrick and John Collison, and now two of the world's youngest billionaires. Check that out in the European edition. Now to a story we're watching. Google is working with publishers on a new product called Stamp. Now, according to a person familiar with the matter, this would serve up articles in a mobile magazine-like design similar to Snapchat's Discover service. Now, Stamp evolved from media relationships Google already has for another one of its products that's called AMP, which is meant to help load articles faster. With us now to discuss this story is our guest host, Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick. And joining us from San Francisco is Bloomberg's Sarah Fryer. Sarah, first to you of course you cover snapchat and the like and this seems reminiscent instagram copied stories very well from from snap and now we see google covering managing to take a leaf from the book in terms of discoveries is is this vindication to the business model or is this a worry i think that this this company, Snap, has just been very inventive in terms of how we communicate on our mobile phones. And everyone else, all these other internet companies are realizing, oh, we need to do some of that. So there's a lot of copycatting going around. You mentioned Instagram, but other Facebook properties have also copied Snapchat stories. Now here comes this mobile media product that Google wants to do. So yeah, it is, it is concerning because Snap is, is a young, newly public company that's trying to prove that it's providing something to its users that nobody else is, and, and sort of creating this addictive quality, especially among a younger set of people. Um, the question is whether people will, will feel like they don't need to download Snap because they, they're getting the same thing elsewhere. This is a key concern, of course, David, as we head into next week and we've got earnings coming from Snap. Have you been overall optimistic or pessimistic on this stock? Well, on the stock, maybe not hugely optimistic, but I still think Snap has a fantastically secure place in the marketplace in general. And I don't think just because Google began to serve up news stories in a manner somehow somewhat similar to the way they might look on Snap, that that's going to significantly reduce the usage of Snap by people who still use it almost entirely to communicate with others and, and to project their own image to others. You know, there, I think Snapchat has a very strong position, but it is true, as Sarah says, Snap has been an amazingly inventive company. When I look at this development, though, to be honest, I see Google borrowing from Snap in large part to compete with Facebook because Facebook is where people increasingly get all their news. Google is a very big news player. I saw an, a company called eBiz ranks them second in the United States at 150 million unique vi visitors for news every month after only Yahoo. But Facebook is the place that all the news sites end up getting their distribution. Facebook, too, has been increasing the speed with which news stories display, which is what this is partly about. So you're going to see a kind of a scrum as more, you know, news is going online. It's going mobile. Snap is an innovator, but they're not necessarily going to be the primary news innovator.
Sarah, talk to us about that scrum that David mentions there, because he's exactly right. They're not, we're not seeing content deals just coming from the likes of Google. We're seeing it across the board from Twitter, from Apple, from Facebook. Why the obsession with media? So the obsession with media, there, there are a couple components to this. First of all, there is a, a looming concern among brands about putting their ads next to content that's safe. You remember that scare with YouTube earlier this year where some brands saw that they're, they were being placed against extremist content or racist content. This is, these projects where people work, where the internet companies are working directly with the publishers help ensure brand safety because they can say like oh listen we're working with cnn we're working with vox we're working with places that you know that you can put your ads by maybe pay a premium for that and so that's one of the reasons very important to brands to have brand safety as they call it and then the other reason is the way people consume news as as david mentioned has moved so much to the internet so much to these social networks and in the wake of the last presidential election and in a lot of other conflicts around the globe, we've, we've seen that, that the way people consume news is not necessarily uh, linked to you know, in, in the right information. We've seen a lot of misinformation, a lot of biased news out there. And so one of the things that Google's really been working on, Facebook too, is trying to make sure that their users are informed. And in order to do that, they're, they're working more closely with publishers to make sure that the higher quality content gets a little bit better play on their platforms. Bring back Sarah Fryer. Always great to get your analysis. Thank you very much indeed. Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick, you're sticking with us. Now coming up, the debate over who's responsible for social media posts when it pits Congress against Silicon Valley. And this weekend on Bloomberg Television, we bring you our best interviews from the week, including our exclusive conversation with Square and Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey. Tune in this Saturday for the best of Bloomberg technology. This is Bloomberg. Now, the debate over who is responsible for what people post on social media has been reignited. In the U.S., a new bill proposed by Ohio Senator Rob Portman would make it easier for state attorneys to go after tech companies accused of not doing enough to combat exploitative content. Joining me now to discuss is Michael Beckman, Beckerman, the CEO of the Internet Association, the group that represents companies like Airbnb, Facebook, Google. Michael, always great to have you joining the show. And I'm going to get nitty gritty on the legalese now because it's Section 230, 230, the Communications Decency Act, 20 year old statute. This is what is looking to be overturned. And what do you believe, therefore, it could do in terms of the publisher's immunity or lack thereof afterwards? Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, first, let me say uh, companies like Backpage and other websites like that that traffic and have other illegal activity have no place on the Internet. The Department of Justice needs to go after them, prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law and beyond. Um, and, and we are looking to work and are working every day with uh, Justice Department and every state uh, to ensure that these actors are knocked off the Internet and knocked out of our society. The problem with the legislation that we're seeing is it will tie our hands. Technology companies, uh, again, are working with uh, law enforcement in every single state to stop these people. And under this law, the new, if it was passed, um, they wouldn't be able to do that. So just to give our viewers some background, Backpage.com seems to have been accused of perhaps enabling sex trafficking in particular. This is what the Congress members and Senate, what the U.S. lawmakers have been digging into and therefore proposed this rule change. If not the change or the overturning of Section 230, what should be changed? How can they make it less broad, more focused, so that it doesn't knock away the, the whole, like throw the baby out with the bathwater, as you might say? Yeah, we're working with the Senate currently on a proposal that would expand the Department of Justice, Justice's authority under the criminal code that would give them more tools in their toolbox to go after Backpage and other actors like that to ensure that victims have justice and to assure that there are no more victims from today forward. You say tech is the solution and of course 
We have heard, particularly in the fight against terrorist content, Facebook has been looking to use counter-narrative means of being able to help, you know, take this content offline and be able to tackle it. But what else are the companies that you represent actually actively doing to try and ensure that sex trafficking isn't in any way ignited by their platforms and indeed some of the other more spurious content? Yeah, I mean, our companies are, are the good actors here, and they have a social conscience, as you know, that is unparalleled in, paralleled in any other industry, um, both from starting organizations that fight this content to developing the technology and artificial intelligence to block ads, search ads, um, set up sting operations to bring down the people who are breaking the law and hurting society. And all that technology has been coming from engineers from our companies and been backed by our companies. And so they're working every single day with state, local, federal law enforcement to stop people who are breaking the law and uh, doing harm. I mean, not everyone might agree with the fact that this industry is more than any other industry got a higher social conscience because many a company perhaps has taken some time to admit that they potentially have some responsibility in the role to play. Do you feel that they all admit the responsibility now? I, I don't think that our companies have a responsibility, but they go about, uh, they, they care a lot about this and um, it matters to them. You know, the internet is a place that is a largely a force for good. And when you have a company like Backpage.com on the internet, it gives everybody a bad name. And um, I think the companies that we represent really want to make Backpage go away and all illegal content online go away. And they're working on that every single day. Michael Beckerman, always great to have your viewpoint here, CEO of the Internet Association. Thank you for joining us today. Now coming up, more trouble at Uber. Reports that the company knowingly rented defective cars to its drivers in Singapore. This is Bloomberg. Now, Netflix has announced its first Chinese language original series from Taiwan. Now, the streaming platform announced a collaboration with Taiwan based director Sam Kwa on a supernatural jailbreak thriller called Bardo. Netflix has long struggled to break the lucrative Chinese market. However, an April licensing deal with the video streaming platform that's a subsidiary of Chinese search engine Baidu finally opened a path around the country's regulators. Now for an update on Uber's business in Singapore. And now according to the Wall Street Journal, the company willingly rented defective cars to its drivers. The report says Uber bought over 1,000 Honda Vezel SUVs and leased them to their drivers. One of the defective vehicles caught fire back in January while it was in use. The driver walked away unhurt, but the accident is yet another mark for a company already in turmoil. Joining me now to discuss this, our guest host for the hour, Economy CEO David Kirkpatrick. Another blot, really, on Uber. I mean, is this Uber of old or still Uber of current? Well, Uber clearly has an impaired corporate culture. And I think this story of a car fall, catching on fire after they knew that it needed to be repaired and they didn't get it repaired is embarrassing and worse. It's actually shameful. But, you know, there's also elements in the story, as the Wall Street Journal originally reported it, that shows some of the Uber managers were trying to do the right thing. I think we're a little bit in a point right now where anything about Uber that has the slightest negative is seen as a, a total condemnation of a company that has just had so much bad news about it, so many bad behaviors shown within it that, you know, we're inclined to believe the worst about Uber. So this is a bad story. They did the wrong thing in some respects, but it's, I think, probably seen as even worse than it really is because these guys are just serial, you know, stupid people and, and er offended. making errors time and time again. And they have, of course, been trying to overhaul this. They've got some great new talent coming in. They've got Bosma St. John, chief brand officer. They've got Francis Fry of Harvard Business School. They're trying to t change things. Talk to me, though, about the business model of actually leasing cars to their drivers. Do you think this is one they should be in? Well, I think that's that's really their call uh, as long as but to, to lease damaged cars is totally unconscionable. I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with them leasing cars to their drivers. Uh, they do need a CEO, they need a CFO, they need a lot of other people that they haven't got, by the way. Yeah, the search continues and we all remain riveted. David Kirkpatrick, Takanomi, CEO, always a joy to have you with us, guest hosting for the hour. We wish you a wonderful weekend.
And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder that we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out. It's at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. New York, 2 p.m. San Francisco, 10 p.m. right here in London. That's all for now. Have a wonderful weekend. This is Bloomberg.